Today we are going to study chapter 3 in the book of Hebrews and I think it will have become apparent that the book of Hebrews is about the substance, Jesus Christ, to which all the shadows pointed. And Paul's burden is to convince his fellow Hebrews and all of humanity of the centrality of Jesus Christ. And that will be his burden in chapter 3 as well. Now I've titled this one, Greater Than Moses. But before we continue, let us just pray. Heavenly Father, as we delve into the writings of Paul in your word, I again pray that you will enlighten us with your spirit. There are such momentous truths hidden in these lines and we pray that you will help us to glean what is essential for us and for our time. In Jesus' name, Amen. So if we turn to chapter 3 of the book of Hebrews, it stands in stark contrast to chapter 4. Now, chapter 4 is about God's rest. And chapter 3 is about those that did not enter into that rest. So it's a very important chapter for us because it will give us clues as to what the pitfalls are on the way and the trappings that Satan will set for those who want to follow the narrow path. So it is in contrast to chapter 4, the chapter on rest, and if our experience does not transcend that of chapter 3, we will remain in a parched land and never find the promised rest. Now, sadly, many Christians seem determined to repeat the history of Israel and choose either of two extremes to find the promised rest. They either believe that the benevolence of God will save them in their sins or they seek to gain entrance into the kingdom of God by their works. Our choices during the wilderness journey determine the outcome. Of those 600,000 men, besides women and children, that crossed the Red Sea, only two entered the promised land. We need to think about these things. So chapter 3 is a very important chapter for us in regards to the way we should approach our experience. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. I like the way he always puts Jesus at the center of every single issue that he discusses who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who has builded the house has more honor than the house. Obviously it was Paul's burden to explain to his Hebrew fellows 
what the position of Jesus Christ was because they were so attached to the shadows, to the types, that they could not see the anti-type. They couldn't grasp the substance. And this was the burden of his heart. If only you could understand that the substance was there from the beginning and the shadows just pointed to it. But they were so fixated on Moses and they were convinced that if they followed Moses and everything that he explained, that was enough. And if you miss the substance, and so he says he was of more glory than Moses. More honor goes to him because he built the house. He is the substance of their shadows. If we go to the attitude of the Pharisees and try to understand their mindset, this becomes very clear when you look at the situation that occurred when Jesus healed the man that was born blind. And when he finally came before the Pharisees, the Bible says in John 9, 28, then they reviled him and said, thou art his disciple, referring to Jesus, but we are Moses' disciples. So this was the issue. This was the burden of Paul's heart. How could he bring it across that they would understand the substance and distinguish it from the shadow? They continued, We know that God spoke unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said to them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he has opened mine eyes. So this was the mindset that Paul was confronted with. In Matthew 26, verse 6, we says, But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Not only was he greater than Moses, he was greater than the temple because the entire temple typology was a shadow pointing to Christ. In Matthew 12, verse 41, we read, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the teaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So he was greater than Moses, greater than the temple, and greater than the prophets. Matthew 12, verse 42, The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. So he was greater than the typological offerings of the temple, greater than the construction of the temple, because every portion of the temple referred to him greater than the prophets and greater than the greatest king that Israel ever had. He was the king of kings. He was the Lord of lords. This is what Paul tried to bring across. So he was greater than the ceremonial law, greater than the prophets, and greater than the kings. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4, it says, For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things, is God. Now we need to put that on a scale because in Colossians 1.16, Paul writes, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So if he built all things, and Paul says, he that built all things, who is he referring to? He's referring to Jesus Christ. And then he says, is God. So this is a very important point, And we've dealt with it in chapter 1, but here he reiterates it. Hebrews 3 verse 5 
And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. So he tells the Hebrews, Moses was faithful, yes, but he was just a servant. But Christ, as a son of his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. So he's constantly contrasting shadow with substance, shadow with substance, and pleading with the Hebrews to embrace the substance. Verse 7 says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says today, if you hear his voice, Harden not your heart, says in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. So they didn't enter into the rest, but God wants his people to enter into rest. So today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of the temptation, in the wilderness. Now this is a quote from Psalms 95 verse 8. And it is repeated in Hebrews 3 verse 15 and again in Hebrews 4 verse 7. So do you think Paul is trying to emphasize a point here? If he says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Verse 9 says, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works 40 years, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. So we need to discuss the reasons why they could not enter into the rest. And why it is important that today, if you hear his voice, you do not harden your heart. Now, as we said, we will deal with one chiastic structure in each of the chapters. There are many, again, let me reiterate that, even between chapters, and we cannot deal with that because that would take up all the time. This is a very simple one in chapter 3. It's a, got an A, B, A structure. Hebrews 3, verse 7, Wherefore? As the Holy Ghost says, today, if you hear his voice, Hebrews 3.13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And then verse 15, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. So sandwiched between the two todays, if you hear his voice, you have exhort one another daily while it is called today. This is such a beautiful little chiasm, just stuck there in chapter 3, telling us what it means today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. It means that you have to, on a daily basis, make sure that you are on the right track. Exhort one another daily while it is called today. This is the heart of the matter in the heart of the chiastic structure in Hebrews chapter 3. And we need to be careful that we consider what the Hebrews did while they wandered those 40 years in the desert so that we do not fall into that same trap. Now, the King James says, exhort one another daily. We'll come to that. So doomed to wandering because of unbelief, they sojourned in circles pulling up their tent pens only to fix them again in a parched land. Restless, aimless, dissatisfied, hungry, thirsty, murmuring souls fainting within. This is a description of the wandering in the 40 years. Psalms 4 verse 2 says, O ye sons of men, 
How long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? Leasing means lying. How long will you believe lies? How long will you cling to shadows and ignore the substance? How long will you embrace the lies and reject the truth? We are in the same situation in the world today. The world is flooded with lies and humanity is just too willing to swallow them. So the psalmist says they loved vanity. In Ecclesiastes we le read in chapter 1, Verse 14, And I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Chapter 12, verse 8 says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Well, we need to take note of these verses, because that was the experience of the children of Israel, and that was the example that we should study so as not to emulate it. In 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 15, we read, And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers, and his testimonies, which he testified against them, and they followed vanity. Now that's an interesting statement. So they rejected his statutes, his laws, and his testimonies. They rejected the law and the testimony, or both. Do we have the same situation? I have so many people who write to me and say, my pastor says that we should ignore the testimonies. No, it's the law and the testimonies. And they followed vanity. So if we ignore one or both, we are following vanity. And became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. So if we want to find out what this word actually means, then we can look it up in dictionaries and we can look it up in concordances. But I thought, uh, let's use a modern example. And I looked it up in Bible study tools and it says the following. Vanity is defined as excessive pride in or admiration of one's own appearance or achievements. In other words, it's based on the arm of flesh. The biblical usage describes vanity as having no ultimate meaning, a concept shared with many philosophies. Vanity is recognized only in the accomplishments or appearances of oneself, without the humility to appreciate the merits of others, including God. If faith is allowed to focus on God, rather, true meaning and joy are to be found. Well, this is what they say. This is, this is true. If your faith is based on yourself, if it is based on human achievement, if human achievement is going to be your saviour, then you will have serious problems in this world. Verse 12 in Hebrews chapter 3, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now unbelief in the word of God is planted into the hearts of men from the minute they come into the educational system of the world. And today, Unbelief in the word of God, particularly in Genesis chapter 1 or anything in between, is rife. Proverbs 4 verse 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. 1 Peter 4 verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand, be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. So skepticism amongst believers can often be traced to a neglect of prayer. So first men depart from God, and then they deny him. And that's what happened to the world. You first neglect your prayer life. In other words, you have no personal communication with God. Then God is put into the closet. Eventually you depart from God, and then you deny him. This is where humanity has come to. 
So it is time to take cognizance and to make a concerted effort to come back to a position where we have a relationship with God. So we must learn to trust and not murmur. The Israelites murmured about three things in particular. Number one, they murmured about bread and flesh foods. Number two, they murmured about water. Number three, they murmured against an inability to conquer. Now, is there anything wrong with uh, water or bread? No. So, what is it that they were murmuring about? Their personal comfort. But they neglected the higher meanings of the spiritual aspects of spiritual bread, spiritual water. And they were murmuring because they were unable to conquer in their own strength. And this is the problem with humanity. We have whole religious systems in the world that do nothing other than try to conquer in their own strength. And that is why the world is in the state that it is in. So the, their solutions to these three problems in their lives were return to the flesh pots of, and rivers of Egypt, or to try to conquer the enemy in their own strength. We'll do it. Now, if we look at the world today, and we look at the movies that are coming out, isn't it uh, absolutely evident that humanity is going to solve their problems by force, or by science, or by whatever? So when we look at this bread from heaven that came down, this manna, and we read in Exodus 16, verse 1, and it says, And they took their journey from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. On the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. This is after two months. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. So here was the issue. They were murmuring about food and flesh. And then when the bread fell, they despised even that. Numbers 11, 6 says, And now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. So if we despise the bread that came down from heaven, then there's no cure for the hunger of the soul. Imagine if you despise this bread. This bread that we are studying right now, and we're in chapter 3. And we're looking at the issue of today and how to enter into the rest of God. This is the issue of chapter 3. So we must learn lessons from what happened here. What was their problem with the water? And all the congregation, Exodus 17 verse 1, of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in the Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted therefore water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? I think that humanity is dying of thirst. And they are complaining and muttering as far as they go because they have never learned to drink this water and to take it as it stands. 
They put their own interpretation upon it and wonder why their thirst is not satisfied. If you drink this water, you will thirst again, but I will give you living water and you will never thirst again. Give me this water. This is what we should be asking. Verse 4 says, And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, Is the Lord amongst us or not? Strike the rock. Now we know that the rock is a symbol of Christ. And he was to be once smitten for all of humanity in order to satisfy that thirst of the human soul. If we do not understand the substance and we live in the shadow, we will remain thirsty. If we neglect the water of life, there's no cure for our spiritual thirst. John 4 verse 10 says, Jesus answered and said to her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, they would have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. And the woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? So the answer in John 7.38, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So Christ refers to faith in himself and in the scriptures. And if you internalize those two, then you will have access to that living water. We read in the Spirit of Prophecy, he finds an all-absorbing, commanding, attractive character in Jesus Christ. That's the one who is looking. The one who died to deliver him from the deformity of sin and with quivering lip and tearful eye, he declares, He shall not have died for me in vain. Thy gentleness has made me great. How prone we are on all occasions to look to our fellow men for sympathy, for uplifting, instead of looking to Christ. How ready is the human agent to forsake the fountain of living water, the cool snow waters of Lebanon, and drink of the true turbid streams of our valley. Oh, in his mercy and faithfulness, God will cause our fellow men, in whom we place confidence, to fail us in order that we may learn the folly of trusting in man and making flesh our arm. Listen to the words of the prophet. See Jeremiah 17, 5-6. Talk of heavenly things. Talk of the eternal weight of glory that will be awarded to the overcomer and you will have success in your work. Today, the arm of flesh is the only one that we are grabbing and even the churches are asking us to embrace the arm of flesh. It is time we did some serious introspection. Let's look at Numbers chapter 13, when the spies were sent into Canaan, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler amongst them. A rather sad statement. Rulers, the leaders. And they returned, these spies, from searching out the land after forty days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. 
It's interesting. They went against the fruit of the land, but they were against the hardship that they envisioned that it would take to get there. And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, what a terrible word, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, just a synonym for nevertheless, we saw the children of Anak there, and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the sea coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. And that terrible word again in the Bible, but... The men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. We have so many people in the world that say, We are not able. We are not able to cope with this situation. We have to run to the arm of flesh to help us. In any case, this thing is too big. That giant we won't conquer. There's no God in heaven. They are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is the land that eateth up its inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. They're the scientists of the world, the most brilliant minds. We cannot go against the popular thinking of the world. And the ecclesiastics are standing behind them. There's no way that we can conquer. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. And then the people rebelled. And all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness. Now it's interesting that God in his kindness chose the second option. He didn't let them die in Egypt. But he did fulfill their wish that they should die in the wilderness. Do we want to die in the wilderness? Because we think we are unable to take the land or that it is not yet time to conquer Canaan? And wherefore has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. Well, in the previous chapter, we studied why the captain of our salvation was made perfect through suffering to lead God's people through a wilderness experience to Canaan. But these people says, let us make us a captain that will take us back to Egypt. Well, it's not hard. You can just go to Rome and choose one and go back to Egypt. Or you could choose to follow the captain of your salvation. And if we now neglect so great a salvation, we will have a problem. But the world has chosen another captain. And they're listening to that captain who doesn't speak one word about salvation, but speaks about creating a perfect world down here and making the people suffer even more than the one who would lead them to salvation. It is impossible to conquer Canaan if we choose another captain. The earthly captains that we are dealing with in our lives today are not there to conquer Canaan. They want to make their home here on earth. They're waiting for a temporal millennium when the problems will be removed, but they're not looking for salvation. So Israel was defeated in battle. 
were when they tried to go their own way. And Moses told these sayings unto the children of Israel, and the people murmured greatly. And they rose up early in the morning and get them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and will go up unto the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord? But it shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not amongst you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. I would like to say the same thing in the times that we are living in. Go ahead. Do what those other captains say. It will not prosper. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you and you shall fall by the sword, because you are turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed, they were presumptuous, to go up onto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp to the law and to the testimony. Didn't go with them. So we need to study the law and the testimony and stay in the circle of that power. If we neglect it and run with the world and after that other captain, there will be no blessing in it. And then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill and smote them and discomforted them even unto Horma. So they refused to learn the lesson of the past. They did not deny the past. They would be very quick to tell you how God had delivered them from Egypt, but they feared the present and trusted him not to deliver them from present circumstances. And we are exactly the same. We are exactly the same. We say we believe in the Lord and the Lord saved us and he brought us into his embrace. But when it comes to really trusting him, no, we turn to the arm of flesh. Psalms 106 verse 24, Yea, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word, but murmured in their tents and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their seed also amongst the nations and to scatter them in the lands. They joined themselves also unto Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Did you take note of that verse? They joined themselves to Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Aren't we invited as Christians to partake in a universal Eucharist? Isn't that a sacrifice of the dead? This is what caused their downfall. Are we doomed to repeat it? Did we join ourselves to Baal Peor? Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions and the plague broke in upon them. This is the burden of Paul in chapter 3. Do not follow this route. Do not be like the Israelites were. We read in the signs of the times, God speaks to us today in warnings, counsels, reproofs given to ancient Israel. If we depart from him, our condemnation will be greater than theirs. For we have their experience as a warning and all the instruction which God has given since their time. Many and varied are the idols which we cherish, idols that engross the mind and harden the heart so that sacred things are not rightly valued. Oh, that the lessons given to ancient Israel might so impress our hearts and affect our lives that we would fully turn from idols to serve the living God. We need to contemplate these things more and more. The work is soon to close. The members of the church militant who have proved faithful will become the church triumphant. 
in reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God, as I see what God has wrought. I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we ha shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. We are now a strong people if we will put our trust in the Lord. For we are handling the mighty truths of the word of God. We have everything to be thankful for. If we walk in the light as it shines upon us from the living oracles of God, we shall have large responsibilities. Corresponding to the great light given us of God, we have many duties to perform because we have been made the depositaries of sacred truth to be given to the world in all its beauty and glory. We are debtors to God to use every advantage he has entrusted us to beautify the truth of holiness of characters and to send the message of warning and of comfort, of hope and love to those who are in darkness of error and sin. This is our opportunity. Are we going to grab it? Or are we going to be like the Israelites and turn to the arm of flesh and forget our history, forget our beautiful health message and the warnings that we, that we have, that we are to give? We have a ministry of healing. My brethren, it is altogether too late in the day to be half-hearted serving diverse lusts and cherishing traits of character that will exclude you from heaven. You cannot put away the evils of your doings too soon. I beseech you to make thorough work for eternity. Now is the accepted time, beloved. Now is the day of salvation. As Paul said, today, when you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. How thankful we should be for such an assurance weighted with the grace of our God. The Lord Jesus yearns over us with intense earnestness. He desires that we shall be saved. But we shall perish if we depart from God and place ourselves in the enemy's power. God has forbidden his people to stand upon Satan's ground. Our God has built round about us a wall of protection, lest we become exposed to the temptations that beset us on every side. Now is the time to listen to this advice, to start drinking living water out of the word. I believe that many of us are in the same danger as was Israel of old. He brought them out of Egypt, but they trusted him not to bring them into Canaan. He brought us out of darkness into his glorious light. Are we going to trust him to bring us into Canaan? Will we be able to stand when the pressure is brought to bear upon us? The world's greatest need, the greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost soul are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. I must say that I have been encouraged of late. Even though there was a time when it looked like an almost impossible situation to see young people stand up and stand for the truth though the heavens fall. I'm longing for the leaders to stand up and stand like the needle to the pole. But the young people, some of our young medical doctors, some of our young people that are not steeped in years and years of theology are standing up and giving the trumpet a certain sound. May more and more and more join them. Beware of hardness of heart creeping in amongst us. Mark 10 verse 5, And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart 
He wrote you this precept. Romans 2 verse 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Hebrews 3 verse 13, But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So this is the burden of chapter 3. But it gets interesting now because this little word here in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13, exhort one another daily. It's not translated like that in all the Bibles. So let's look at the definition. Here's Merriam-Webster's definition. Definition of exhort. Transitive verb. To incite by argument or advice. Urge strongly exhorting, for example, voters to do the right thing, intransitive word, to give warning or advice, make urgent appeals. That's what it means. Make an urgent appeal. Use strong arguments to convince people. Give them evidence. That's what it means to exhort. If we go and look at the, the definition in Taya, it's to call to one side, to call for, to summon, to address, to speak to, which may be done in the way of exhortation, entreaty, comfort, instruction, to admonish, to exhort, to beg, to entreat, to beseech, to strive, to appease by entreaty, to console, to encourage and strengthen by consolation, to comfort, to encourage and strengthen, exhort, comforting, encouraging. So basically, you are basically begging people through strong arguments to accept the truth. Now let's look how the NIV translates this verse. Hebrews 3.13, But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Let's go to the web pages that give Bible commentary and just see how they consider this word encourage. And here's an interesting web page, and it says, what is the difference between exhortation and encouragement? Exhortation is like a form of teaching. In other words, you are encouraging people, yes, but through strong argument to take a position and a stand. It's like a form of teaching. It encourages you to take actionable steps given in the Word of God. Encouragement is practicing telling people what they are doing great in. Isn't that interesting? So encouraging people is telling them you're doing great, continue. That's not exhortation. Exhortation is entreating them and warning them through strong arguments. In fact, the NIV is telling people to stay exactly like they are and continue on their path, whereas the King James Version tells people to change their path and to consider. It's the exact opposite. Verse 14 in Hebrews chapter 3, For we are made partakers of Christ, if... We hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. We've discussed this in the chiastic structure a little bit earlier. We harden our hearts gradually. It is hearing but not obeying that leads to the hardening of hearts. Hardening leads to justifying one's actions and justifying leads to rejection, and rejection leads to the slippery slope of perdition. So I think we should contemplate this. If we constantly refuse to do something that God requires of us, just take the health reform for example, eventually we will justify our course and say, oh, that was for that time, or whatever reason we can conjure up in order not to do that which God requires of us. Eventually, 
it will lead to the slippery slope of perdition. Like verse 13 says, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Do people like exhortation in the church? No, they prefer encouragement. They don't like exhortation. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. It is time for God's people to practice exhortation, not only within the church, but out there in the world. That includes warning them of the path that they are on, explaining to them what the consequences of their actions will be, showing them by strong arguments from the word of God where they are walking on a slippery slope and calling them back like Paul is doing in chapter 3. Verse 16 says, For some, when they had heard, did provoke, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Some were faithful. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? So he brought them out with a mighty hand, but they trusted not that he could bring them in. That's rather amazing. They were very happy to say how he brought them out of Egypt. But they were not happy when he was about to bring them in. That's why in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, Paul says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? Let's continue with Hebrew chapter 3, the last two verses. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. So chapter 3 is a warning against unbelief. And it is the antithesis of chapter 4 which invites you into the rest. And so, first the warning, and then the solution. We will deal with that in the next chapter. A statement from the Spirit of Prophecy to end off with. From Elijah's experience during those days of discouragement and apparent defeat, there are many lessons to be drawn. Lessons invaluable to the servants of God in this age, marked as it is by general departure from right. This is the time we are living in, a general departure from right. We have sold out much of what God has given us. He has given us so much light, but we have chosen captains to take us back to Egypt. The apostasy prevailing today is similar to that which in the prophet's day overspread Israel. In the exaltation of the human above the divine, in the praise of popular leaders, in the worship of mammon, and in the placing of teachings of science above the truth of revelation, multitudes today are following after Baal. I think we should contemplate those words very seriously in the time that we are living in. Doubt and unbelief are exercising their baleful influence over the mind and heart, and many are substituting for the oracles of God the theories of men. It is publicly taught that we have reached a time when human reason should be exalted above the teachings of the Word. The law of God, the divine standard of righteousness, is to be declared of no effect. The enemy of all truth is working with deceptive power to cause men and women to place human institutions where God should be and to forget that which was ordained for the happiness and salvation of mankind. Just an example. God gave us a health message. Why should we run with the world? Yet this apostasy, widespread as it has come to be, is not universal. Not all in the world are lawless and sinful. Not all have taken sides with the enemy. God has many thousands, 
who have not bowed the knee to Baal, many who long to understand more fully in regard to Christ and the law, many who are hoping against hope that Jesus will come soon to end the reign of sin and death. And there are many who have been worshipping Baal ignorantly, but with whom the Spirit of God is still striving. My brothers and sisters, as we approach the final moments of Earth's history, is it not time that we exhort the nations and our own people to pick up the standard, to stand like the needle to the pole, to accept the warning as given in chapter 3, so that we can enter into chapter 4, which is the rest of God. Let us pray that our church will wake up so that we can give the trumpet a certain sound and exhort the nations who have not fully understood these things but long to understand them to come into a full relationship with Jesus Christ and to be part of of that rest that we will talk about in the next chapter. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is necessary that we also take heed of the warnings and not just of the promises in the Word of God. Thank you for chapter 3, which calls us to make a U-turn in our lives and to follow in the footsteps of of the one who went before us, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.